Welcome to the studio review for chapter 12 in the C-Sharp curriculum. This is If It Ain't Broke, Add a Breakpoint. Chapters 11 and 12 were about exceptions and tools for debugging. So we're going to practice a little bit of that. They want us to go back to the spinning disks project. This was something that we did in chapter 8. But they have a different branch, debugging branch here, that they'd like us to check out. And they have their own solution for the CD and DVD spinning disks. And so we're going to use their solution and use the debugger to try to find an error and just to practice using the tools. That's the value of the studio really is just getting comfortable with the tools. So I'm going to show you a few things, but I really recommend that you play around with it yourself because uh, that really is what this is about is getting accustomed to using the different aspects of these debugging tools to help you when you're coding to get through your code, find errors, understand what's happening behind the scenes, and even help use it as a tool to help you understand other people's code. So let's go over and take a look at the code. We can see here in program.cs, they have a CD created and a DVD created from those two classes. They call spin disk and read data. What they've done is these are the two methods that are required by the interface optical disk. That's all that has to be defined. CD defines it one way. Would you like to play a game, for instance, on read data? DVD defines it as, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. And then uh, for the other one, spin disk, CD says uh, a CD spins at the rate of 200 to 500 RPM, and DVD says that a DVD spins from 570 to 1600 RPM. So other than that, everything else is just inherited from base disk. This is the abstract class that is the base class for any type of disk. There's a name, a total storage capacity, uh, capacity used and remaining capacity. There's a disk type. And then they've got this list of contents. Uh, they don't actually use it. So we can just kind of ignore that. But they do have you pass in you know, name, max capacity, and disk type and then possibly some use capacity uh, if the disk already has some things on it. Um, and then there are a couple of instance methods here to check and see whether the capacity used is um, whatever has been passed in or if it is instead uh, full because it's actually as much as, as the possible storage capacity. And then here, they're just calculating how much space is left by taking whatever the storage capacity is and subtracting capacity used. Okay. So we can see that for the objects that they created, the CD has a max capacity of 700. So that gets set to storage uh, capacity. And then 350 has been used so far. So that means we would expect that some of these you know, other properties are going to get set to values based on that, right? Um, and same thing with DVD. Uh, we're going to see how, you know, in, in inheriting from base disk, it's going to apply the exact same system. So this one says it has a maximum capacity of 4,700 uh, megabytes and 1,450 have been used so far. So we're going to use the debugger to look at all of these different properties that are inherited and take a look and see what their values are at any given point in time as we move through the code. And then, of course, when we get down here and we write data to it, that should change the numbers, right? So if we come over here and see, uh, you know, the write data method here where it's um, either checking to make sure there's enough space to write something, and if not, it's going to alter capacity used and remaining capacity, and then, you know, confirm data has been written and the remaining space is the remaining capacity, which has just been changed. So we're going to want to pay attention to all these values, make sure everything is what we expect it to be. And we will step through the code to do that using the debug tools. So I would like to start here, the creation of the CD. And then I would also like to place a breakpoint here where we go to try to write data to it knowing that it has 350 used already out of its 700. And so we, if we're going to try to write something to 275, we should be able to, and there should be 75 left. So let's uh, walk through this. I'm going to use this particular method of debugging. I'm just going to come up to the debug and run button here and say debug. And as soon as I do that, it's 
starts running it, and then it opens the debug console here, which is a different type of console that has some extra information for us. It also opened up the panel over here, the running debug panel. We see that we have variables in play. Um, some of them, it knows that they're there, but it doesn't know what their values are yet because we, we haven't established what those are. And then here's a place where we could, you know, watch some values if we wanted to. We'll look at that in just a minute and so on and so forth. So lots of interesting information here. And we have this little uh, tool thing here with all of our buttons on it. So the general thing to remember about this is when you have a line highlighted, that line has not executed yet. So that's why it says that CD is null because it doesn't know, it hasn't actually been instantiated yet. We have to execute this line. To execute just one line and move forward, we can hit this button right here with the curved arrow that's called step over. So if I step over, it moves down to the next one, but it doesn't execute it yet. Now we see that CD has a value. It rec recognizes that it is in fact an instance of spinning disks.cd. So I can expand this and start to see what all these properties are and their values. Capacity used has been set to 350. The disk type is CDR. The name is CD example. The remaining capacity is 350 and the storage capacity is 700. So everything got set exactly as we would expect it to be based on the values that were passed in and our understanding of how those instance methods were working that were called in the constructor to set those values. So let's move forward and take a look at this. Uh, we move forward one more. The DVD has now been created, so we can open this up a bit and see that it has all of its values, right? Uh, 1,450 used, total of 4,700. That means that there's a remaining capacity of 3,250. Okay, so I want to focus on the CD for now, so I'm just going to collapse that for a second. As we move forward, now we're at spin disk, and nothing has happened yet. We don't see anything in the console. As soon as we step past that and let it execute, we see the output here. A CD spins at a rate of 200 to 500 RPM. So let's keep going. Uh, now the DVD has executed, uh, spins at a rate of 570 to 1600 RPM. Now we can read the data. We'll step over that. Would you like to play a game? If we read the data on the DVD, it says, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. Now we come to our next breakpoint, and uh, it says, you know, that it, we're going to print out the result from cd.writeData275. So we can print that. Let's uh, go ahead and step over it. And it says data written to disk, remaining space is 625. Well, now that can't be right. If we only had 30, 350 to begin with, and we just used another 275, that should be 75, right? So um, we have an issue. These, these should not be the same. Remaining capacity should be less, not more than it was. So we need to investigate this. So what I would like to do is uh, restart this. And this time I'm going to uh, remove the breakpoint that's here. And let's just focus back on that one. We'll start at the top. Okay, so it executes and it stops here at the breakpoint. We can see that we have these values and we can even watch you know, some values here if we want. I mean, cd.name is one of the ones that they say in the instructions they would like us to watch. We don't anticipate ever changing that. It's probably not gonna change. Another thing that I'd like to watch is cd.remaining capacity because that's the one that seems suspicious, right? It, it was higher instead of lower. Let's just keep an eye on that in particular. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. We already know what happens when we step past this. We get an unexpected result. What I'd like to do is step into it. So I can hit this button here to step into, and it goes down into write data. And now we're at the point where it's going to start executing everything inside the body of write data line by line in the base disk file. So let's step through. And so you'll notice that cd.name says error. The name cd does not exist here. And that's true. Right now we're in base disk and uh, cd, uh, both of these relative to cd don't exist here. So if we wanted to actually be able to watch the value, we actually need to change this to remaining capacity while we're in this file. 
and that would be what we're watching. And it says 350. We can also see here that those same values are uh, right here in this, because it's saying, you know, while we're inside this definition, um, we can see the value of the object we're currently examining. So same thing, we can we can see it right here. Okay, so I'm going to keep stepping through. Um, and of course, it's evaluating right now. If the size is greater than remaining capacity, then there's not enough space. We know that's not a problem. It's going to skip right over it, and it did. So now we're at the line where it's going to change capacity used. It just hasn't done it yet. So we should see capacity used go up to 625 here. And it did. So now we're watching remaining capacity. And as I says, step over it, we see it also goes up. And so then we look here and we say, aha, this is where we have an issue. We actually need to be subtracting here and not adding. So that was our error. So let's restart it from the beginning, go back to the original breakpoint, and go ahead and just step over it. And we're going to watch this value uh, right here. We're also watching it right here. And it changes to 75. So this is good. Now we have the capacity use has gone up. The remaining capacity has gone down. And we have discovered our error. And we also made use of this tool to let us step into a method that is not even defined in this file. It's defined in another file. And as we step through and use these buttons to move throughout the code and let it guide us, it takes us where we need to go. We don't need to come over to the file tree and search and say, okay, where was that again? You know, was it in this file or this file or this file? Um, because the debugging tool does it for us. And that's a really powerful tool to have in your tool belt when you're working in an extremely large code base, which it can be so hard to find what you're looking for and to jump around. So um, I highly recommend that you take some time to keep practicing this, uh, using these tools, um, using the buttons, moving around through the code, step in and out of methods, and uh, just you know set breakpoints in different places, watch different values, and uh, see what you can come up with.